Hello and welcome to Freewave TV. I'm Paige Friedman, bringing you the latest in maritime news from around the world. Today in maritime news, a new report details Russia's transporting of stolen grain. Iran to potentially make new shipping routes with Russia and Turkey. Shell to stop paying workers at one of its facilities. A terminal welcomes its first ship without an operator. Diomico will refinance four of its tankers in new package. Synergy partners up for non-flammable rechargeable batteries. Construction begins in Hamburg for first shore power for container ship. As a shipment of grain from Ukraine may resume soon, a new report has come out and shows the illegal transporting of grain in the region. Israeli maritime artificial intelligence firm Windward published a report on what it calls Russia's actions as grain laundering. The report includes previously unpublished information on five vessels partaking in dark activities and ship-to-ship -ship operations in the Kerch Strait in June as part of what would seem to be a coordinated effort to launder grain allegedly stolen from Ukraine. New shipping routes have been in talks as the leaders of Russia, Iran, and Turkey are meeting in Tehran this week. Iran's state-run Islamic Republic of Iran shipping line looks to expand its network by paving the way for the transport of Russian goods to India via the International North-South Transport Corridor, which would allow it to bypass sanctions against Russia. The idea to establish the corridor was first established in September 2000. However, interest in the corridor decreased over geopolitical issues. The idea was reintroduced following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As strikes continue, Shell announced it will no longer pay workers at its Prelude Floating Liquefied Natural Gas Facility offshore Western Australia. Shell told workers after their strike demanding pay increases was extended for another two weeks. Just last week, Shell said it needed to close the FLNG vessel and that it wouldn't be able to supply cargoes until the strike was over. The offshore alliance said that the strike would now continue on to August 4th after Shell wouldn't attempt to make a deal with the union representatives after they rejected the company's most recent pay offer. Normally, you would need to have an operator to run a facility. However, the new Patanga container terminal in Bangladesh welcomed its first ship, despite not having an operator. The port has been dealing with heavy congestion, so the opening of the new terminal was very much needed. Since there isn't a foreign operator at the moment, the Chittagong Port Authority decided it will prioritize geared ships to its new terminal as it looks to fill the role. Diomico International Shipping will be refinancing four tankers after it received an $82 million sustainability-linked funding package. The company's Irish subsidiary, Diomico Tankers, penned a five-year term facility with Ing and Skandinav Visca and Skilda Bonkin to pay off the bank loans maturing in 2023 on the four tankers. Synergy Marine has joined forces with U.S.-based battery developer Awesome Energy and Japanese owner Nissan Kwan to come out with non-flammable, rechargeable batteries for the shipping industry. Under the partnership, Awesome will provide Synergy and Nissan Kwan with one gigawatt of batteries annually for three years from 2025. The batteries are hoped to be a safer alternative that can help the shipping industry meet its goal of zero net emissions by 2050. At the port of Hamburg, construction has started on the first shore power installation, which is being specifically made to handle container ships. The Hamburg City Council gave the green light to the project at the end of last year with the hopes that it will improve air quality and begin dramatically reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2025 in the city. And now, here's the news making headlines around the world. After conducting an annual 10-day mandatory maintenance on the Nord Stream pipeline, Russia's pause on the pipeline caused chaos in most of Europe for 10 days. Today, Russian gas began flowing to Europe via the pipeline. However, many European officials remain fearful of broader cuts to Europe's gas supply. As many tried justifying Russian President Vladimir Putin's seemingly totalitarian authority, 
they tried to claim that he was unwell. The Russian leader is turning 70 in October. Today, William Burns, the director of the CIA, ended the rumors by confirming there was no evidence to suggest the speculations being made. The Kremlin also spoke today about the rumors addressing his health, dismissing them as nothing more than fake. On the other side of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, Ukraine's first lady, Olena Zelenska, spoke to the U.S. Congress on Wednesday. She claimed that the ongoing war in Ukraine had inspired her nine-year-old son to want to become a soldier. Before Russia's invasion, the first lady said how her son would dance to folk music, learn English, and play the piano. Now she says all he wants to do is learn martial arts and how to properly use a rifle. She went on to say that she cannot sway him back towards the arts and sciences. As the war affects children and adult mentalities, she also appealed for more air defense systems. Inflation seems inevitable as the world feels the repercussions of the pandemic and the ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis. Today, for the first time in 11 years, the European Central Bank sets intention to raise interest rates while the U.S. Federal Reserve announced it was opting for another 75 basis point rate hike rather than a greater change at its meeting next week. Reuters estimated Japan with the best outcome after predicting that the country will exceed its projected inflation target but will be able to maintain ultra-low interest rates. Joining the string of political resignations today was Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi. As Italy struggled economically and politically, Draghi's national unity government fell apart. His resignation followed the collapse of his government earlier today. Draghi's action put Italy on course for an early election and sent shockwaves through Italy's financial markets. Setting up the last stage of the contest to replace Boris Johnson, former finance minister Rishi Sunak and foreign secretary Liz Truss are gearing up to battle it out for the Britain's open prime minister position. Sunak has been ahead in every round of voting among conservative legislators, but among the 200,000 members of the ruling party, who will finally decide the victor, Truss appears to be gaining the upper hand. Whoever wins will be announced on September 5th and will inherit some of the most difficult conditions Britain has seen in decades. The Workers' Party in Brazil is set to nominate former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva today for the upcoming October 2nd election. After leading for two terms from 2003 to 2010, Lula's victory would represent an amazing comeback by the former union leader who was forced to step down from his role after receiving corruption convictions that were later annulled. Lula maintains a double-digit lead in opinion polls and vowed to increase the state's role in the economy and increase social welfare while maintaining a free market. Lula's running mate is said to be the centrist former Sao Paulo governor, Geraldo Alckmin. Sri Lanka's Ranil Wickrem S. Singh was inaugurated as president amid expectations that he would help the nation's struggling economy. Although the 73-year-old is deeply unliked by the public, many claim he was too close to its recently ousted ruler, Godabaya Rajapaksha. Although the newly indicted ruler has ties the public may not like, protesters have unanimously agreed to give him a chance as their country continues to crumble over recurring economic crises. After a federal appeals court rejected an objection by abortion clinics, a law prohibiting abortion in Georgia that takes effect when a fetal heartbeat is discovered will go into force. Meanwhile, Republican legislators in Indiana sponsored a bill that would outlaw abortion except in circumstances of rape, incest, or medical emergencies. The American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana took to Twitter, calling the sponsored bill an appalling attack on abortion access. The Indiana bill was proposed by Republican State Senator Sue Glick. Iraq has summoned the Turkish ambassador to Baghdad to demand an apology after a diplomatic dispute between Turkey and Iraq broke out, leading to the deaths of nine civilians and the injuries of at least 23. Iraq State TV said that the fierce artillery bombing hit a park in Zako, a city on the border between Iraq's Kurdistan region and Turkey. Children, including a one-year-old baby, were among the victims. Turkey suggests that forces belonging to the Kurdistan Workers' Party carried out the strike, whereas Iraq is keen on the fact that Turkey was a player in this game. In the Iraqi city of Karbola, the Turkish flag was burned. Three men who were taking part in the Valencia region's traditional Bos el Carrer, or bull running, have died due to the injuries inflicted during a bull encounter. 
Animal rights groups have long complained of the dangers for the public and animals, knowing that there have been 20 deaths from this event in the last eight years. The mayor of Melania responded to their deaths by justifying that the bull was an animal and chance accidents of this type were a risk that people took. The Biden administration is investigating Chinese telecom equipment maker Huawei over concerns that U.S. cell towers fitted with its gear could capture sensitive information from military bases and transmit it to China. Due to the sensitivity of this investigation, many sources are being asked to remain anonymous. The previously unreported probe was opened by the Commerce Department shortly after Joe Biden took office early last year. On, on the oldest ever male giant panda in captivity, has died at age 35. After being gifted in 1999, Anon built a family at Ocean Park Theme Park. He had high blood pressure, and being as ill as he was, Anon's health worsened over the span of three weeks. He eventually stopped eating solid foods and was kept out of sight by visitors. He is now being mourned as a major part of the Ocean Park family. In Cape Town, South Africa, a surgical team led by Dr. Tim Forgan is using a robot to aid with tumor removal. The Da Vinci XI robot is one of two of its kind in Africa. It has four arms and is controlled in real time by Forgan via an immersive 3D console and is the most advanced surgical robot in Africa. The first operation using the robot was performed at Tigerberg Hospital in February. The machine is used mainly for complex urological, gynecological, and colorectal surgeries at these hospitals. We're now gonna take over Jean Louis. He's gonna share what's going on in the sports world. Welcome to another edition of Free Wave TV. As always, I'm your host, Jean Louis, and from the States to across the pond, here are your sports stories from across the globe. The UEFA Women's Championship is nearing its end, as last night saw the first domino of the semifinal games to drop. After a timely comeback, England bested Spain 2-1 to one to eliminate the pre tourney faves in overtime. Now England trailed 1-0 up until the 84th minute, where sub Ella Toon notched a goal to tie. They eventually completed the win after Georgia Stanway, before a capacity-crowded Apex Stadium, scored last. The next domino falls today, as Germany and Austria play their quarterfinal matchup at three. Tomorrow we'll see Sweden and Belgium complete, and then France and Netherlands face off at Saturday's matchup. The rest of the world that is Euro football is ablaze with Champions League qualifiers and such. However, friendlies have taken place as players and teams have gotten acclimated ahead of their ranked competitions. But one team that may be behind the eight ball is Chelsea, as in wake of their ongoing ownership struggles, they lost a Clash of Nations matchup with Charlotte FC. The upset loss sent shockwaves throughout the soccer community, as a team approaching the Florida Cup gears up for their weekend matchup against Arsenal. World Championship news hits once again at Free Wave, as in the land of track and field specialists, Nora Jarutu sets a game record of 8 minutes and 53 seconds en route to winning gold in the women's 3,000 meter steeplechase race. The previous record was shattered yesterday by over 4 seconds. Now the Kenyan born athlete was the first to win gold for Kazakhstan, the country she represented since the start of the year. But how she celebrate? Well, she did what anyone under the 92 degree summer sun would do. She took a plunge into the water pit, celebrating with her federal medalists in kind. It was a big night for China as well, as in an upset, the fourth ranked Fang Bin outduels Olympic champ Valerie Alman in the discus final. The five time medalist Alman took the loss in stride, despite it being bittersweet, but the buck doesn't stop there, as Friday, the 400 meter hurdles final takes place with redemption perhaps on the horizon. The end of the Tour de France is vastly approaching. Sadly, it will be without one of its biggest stars. Four-time champ Chris Froome tests positive for COVID-19, along with Imanol Iverati and Dominino Caruso. Froome, along with the rest of the field, will miss the event. Before the announcement, Froome was ranked 26th in the general classification, with one hour and 27 minutes behind Jonas Vingard in the yellow jersey. Up to this point, his time were on par with his best 
pace since his untimely crash back in 2019. Controversy continues to cloud the incoming participants of LIV Golf. Hendrik Stenson, presumed European captain for the Ryder Cup, announces the tourney's move to strip him from the tourney. The Swedish star announced his piece in a letter posted to Twitter, announcing the move despite LIV's blessing to allow him to participate. Of course, the league is still in an arms race with the PGA, as they come with great controversy being linked to Saudi Arabia. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in the news after a settlement was made with Canada's Hockey Governing Board. The settlement centers around the sexual assault case involving members of the junior national team back in 2018. Their payout was $15 million since that time, with minimal punishment outside the money, of course. Trudeau called out the governing body, expressing the handling of the case is absolutely unacceptable. Let's switch gears here to last night, where the ESPYs took place, of course, and it was hosted by NBA Finals MVP Stephen Curry. And needless to say, the star let loose. Curry hosted with many cameos from his Warriors teammates, as well as past host comedian Kevin Hart and NFL Hall of Famer Peyton Manning, took the center stage. He walked away with two awards, including record-breaking performance, notching the all-time three-point record at the Garden this past season. His teammate Clay Thompson also walked away with an award with the Comeback Player of the Year for his return from ACL and Achilles injuries in consecutive seasons. For the rest of the award show, check out the website for more. And lastly, the Philadelphia Sixers officially re-signed All-Star James Harden to a two-year, $68 million deal. The guard takes a slight discount that will have him have a player option on the deal, allowing him to waive the deal after the following season. The guard averaged 22 points and 10 assists over the course of last season, and what was arguably a down year for the one-time MVP. Now, if that's a down year, expect an MVP season for the comeback kid, 32-year-old. That's all I got for you today. Once again, this is Jean-Louis. This is Free Wave. Here's your sports. Have a fantastic weekend, folks. we have for today. For more detailed news, you can visit our website www.freewavetv.com. On behalf of all of us here at Freewave TV, thanks for watching and we'll see you our next newscast.